running Santa Cruz Core Fitness, coaching, working side by side with Yvonne, a fitness coach, a mind coach, and an inspirational coach. Jamie has a mission and a heart to serve her community with empowerment, action, knowledge, and she has built a team to be around her to do the same. Let's welcome Jamie to the stage. Thank you. Let go of the baggage and, and speak our truth and, and be in our true self and be okay being in our true self even when it's hard. That's how we're going to really be able to thrive. And what really connected me with Yvonne's talk was that she's doing things that are incredible and her last slides that I'm working on this project, it's like we're looking at the, what we think is impossible and it's actually very, very possible. So. This is a word that I've heard before, right? How many of you have, someone has told you no in your lifetime? Right, everybody. I definitely understand the idea of pushing the boundaries and pushing the limits. I'm all about the gray area. I'm all about like, how, do, how, can, I, how can I be the best version of myself and how can I push the limits? But this word's a pretty strong word because it's telling me I can't do something. So what, when I see this word and when I hear this word, I think, how, okay, you're telling me I can't do something. It's not that I can't do something. It's how can I do it? If you're saying I can't do it this way, then there must be another way. I don't think no. I think, how is it possible? And a lot of times we'll stop or people will stop us because we, we have these, these two letters are so powerful, right? And I'm putting this slide up here for a little while because it's, it is such an impactful word on our psyche, right? From when you were little, uh, when I was little. So, God, there's a story that I'll have to share. My, um, when I was little, um, this is a story my mom would actually share that I was just reminded of today. I'll skip the slide because this is kind of, um, I think the drama is over with the word no. Um, <laughs> It wasn't necessarily the best at everything, but I was somehow, somehow I was taught, I was taught to do my best. And I remember being at the school bus stop when I think it was in junior high or high school and I have, I have blonde hair. I color it now because I'm not outside very much, but um, when I was younger it was, it was pretty blonde and um, people thought I was kind of stupid because I had blonde hair, you know, that stereotype, but I was actually like, the smartest kid in my class. And um, I'm, at the, I'm at the bus stop and this kid's like, do you like get paid to get good grades? Like what, why, what's your trip? Like why are you tripping? Why are you, why are you working so hard? And it was like, well, I just, I was just taught to do my best. And it wasn't that I was the best at everything I did. It was that I was doing my best. And when I heard the word no, it was like, okay, you're telling me no, but I'm gonna figure out how to go around it. So like when I was in junior high and they come in, the counselor comes in and they say, okay, what classes do you wanna do? My friend was like, you need to try and take biology as a freshman. And at the time, biology, in high school, no freshman in my school took biology. That just wasn't a thing. And the counselor's in my class and we're in like history or whatever. And he's like, okay, fill this out. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't see biology on here. Like I want to take biology. Oh, oh no, you, you can't take biology. Like we just, that's not allowed. It's only sophomores take biology. And I was like, no, I'm a freshman. I'm going to be a freshman and I'm taking biology. Like that's what's happening. <laughs> and um, I had to go. So he said, no. So then I had to go to the vice principal of the high school, and I'm, I'm not even a freshman yet. I go to the vice principal of the high school, and I'm like, well, I was told that I could maybe take this class, and I want to figure out how I can do it. And so we figure out a way, and sure enough, there I am in, in high school biology as a freshman. And every spring after that, I would go into the vice principal's office and say, okay, well, I want to take these AP classes, and this is what I want, and this is the schedule I want. And he would say, well, we can't just do it for you. You know, you're just one person. I said, oh, well, I'm in a lobby. So, so then I got all of my nerd friends and who also wanted to take the four AP classes, and then I got my way and I got my schedule. So it was like, it was like a running joke, at least when I was in high school, like, who does the schedule, Jamie or the vice principal? <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But going back, um, so yeah, so this is kind of myself as a nerd in, in high school and always trying to do my best. But I started to analyze, like, when this kid's like, well, do you get paid? And it's like, no, I, I just do my best. And why is it that I, that I do my best? Well, it's about heart. It's about passion. 
It's about following your heart and being true to your heart. And so for me, doing my best means bringing my best self forward and, and following my heart and doing that. And when I follow my heart and I'm in that space, I'm resonating at a higher frequency. And when I resonate at a higher frequency, guess what? You all resonate at a higher frequency, right? And then we together create something great. So when I was, let's see, I'm, I'm old, I feel old now. I'm like reaching. Um, when I was in kindergarten, my parents were hippies and they grew up, they were here since they went to UCSC. I grew up in Santa Cruz and Nel, um, Jesse Jackson came to town and he was speaking at the Civic and we saw him and I was literally five years old and I remember this, like he's walking, there's a bunch of people, my hands out and there's like all these people and I'm like trying to get him to shake my hand. I lied, I said he shook my hand in kindergarten, he didn't, my hand was too small. <laughs> but I was there. And we don't know how these things that happen when we're so young affect us, right? I, I don't know why. I, in high school, I couldn't figure out why I was trying to do my best. But the example was set, for, set in front of me when I was five years old, that here's this African-American guy who's a reverend running for president, and that was like unheard of. So now it brings me to my story that my mom would tell. I was in the sandbox at school playing in kindergarten, and I had just seen Jesse Jackson. I don't remember this. And I had just seen him, and I'm talking to my kindergarten friends about Jesse Jackson and why they should vote for him for president. And I'm five, right? So my kindergarten teacher is listening. And she can hear me talking about why I think Jesse Jackson should be the next president. And all, I had really, you know, my bullet points. I was very organized. And sure enough, she tells my mom that she changed her vote because of me. And I'm five. It's like, isn't that crazy? The impact you have, you're five, you don't know anything. I mean, like, I guess I do something. So then now I'm six or seven. And at six or seven, first grade, we had an orange, Yvonne was talking about that orange bug. We had an orange bug. It might have been two-tone at the time, but we definitely had an orange bug. And Nelson Mandela had just been liberated and just gotten out of jail after like 26, 27 years. And we had three kids in the family. I was a middle child, so I'm needed the most attention. I definitely talked the most at dinner. And I always had to outdo myself and you know, beat my older brother and pick on my younger sister. That's kind of how it worked. And so there was something different about me though because I apparently was passionate about politics at age five. So my dad took me, he didn't have a ticket, but he took me to see Nelson Mandela at the Oakland Coliseum. And I remember being there, plain as day, I remember being there and we did not have, a, we only had one ticket. And it was up in the like nosebleed section. And we got another ticket. And we go in, and sure enough, it's like literally this far from Nelson Mandela, and that's where I got to sit. I was six. And my dad was like way up in the nosebleeds, and there are these families, you know, around. And I, I grew up in Santa Cruz, it's a predominantly white area. You know, I had no African American people at my school, and I'm surrounded by a different culture all around me at, at six. And my dad's like, would you watch my child? Like, I have my tickets up there. And I'm like, oh God. So I'm sitting there with these strangers who like brought me in as like, I'm one of them and, and I get to see this. I don't remember what he said, but I saw amazing music and I saw him and that stuck with me again. I'm 36 and we're talking about heart. So I thought I wanted to go into politics because these people were movers and shakers in the community. They were just like phenomenal individuals. They made I mean, they sacrificed their lives for people and they just had incredible things to say. And then I decided I didn't want to be president anymore. At seven, I was wanting to be president and then when I got into college, I was like, I don't think so. Um, I even wrote a book about wanting to be president of the United States. Um, but really, it wasn't about being president of the United States. It was about being here, right? Being in this space here and making a difference. So I didn't realize that at five and at six, it would be so impactful to my life. But my whole mission is to do service. And I was like, okay, I wanna do service. Like that all sounds really good, and, you know. But how do I make money doing that? You know, God, I don't wanna like be a pauper. And like we grew up and we struggled, you know, like, you know, my mom was like, oh, he's, you think we're poor? I'm like, I don't, I don't know any, I have no concept of that, you know? And, um, and we, we worked hard, you know, and we, we had challenges like anyone. And 
But what it taught me was to be resourceful. So now I'm passionate about wanting to go into politics and I'm learning from my parents that like, no is not the right answer. It's how can I find a way, okay? So politics, how can I find a way to be the first female president? That's where I'm at. And then I decided I didn't want to be president, but I still wanted to do service. And fast forward to when I'm in high school, I got super into science and super nerdy and loved just the body and the way that the body functioned. I go into college and I start studying biochemistry. So I was a biochemistry major as well. And God, I just, I loved science. And I, um, I went, I grew up in Santa Cruz and I said, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to get as far away from Santa Cruz as possible because I don't want to stay in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is like not the place to be. And sure enough, I go to Massachusetts for one year of school and get ho so homesick, I'm back here within less than 12 months. <laughs> so if you've traveled or been anywhere, you find that you come back to Santa Cruz and isn't it just like one of the most beautiful places you've ever seen in your life? I mean, we are so lucky. So how do you pursue your passion successfully? What brings you joy? How do you connect with your heart and how do you pursue it? If I'm not feeling joy and if I'm not feeling openness in my heart space, then something is not in alignment. And then, I, then, then we get stuck, then I get stuck. So I played basketball my first year in college and I, again, wasn't the best, but I freaking, I tried the hardest. And yesterday I was going over my talk with Bo and he goes, you know what your sister said about you? And I was like, oh great, what? They're like really good friends. And, and he said, you, you always gave it everything you had, right? I didn't, I didn't know she even paid attention. But I was one of those kids that like, you know, the football team worked out at six in the morning and I was like the girl that was like, I wanna be buff, like how do I do that? And so at six in the morning, sure enough, there I am as a freshman working out with all these seniors and juniors every day of the week in high school. And so I always gave it my all. And going back to college, coming to UCSC within the first two weeks of being at school, I got hit by a car. I played basketball in college and I tore my ACL and rehab was biking. So I was riding up campus by the gym and I was coming back down and I always say that, you know, the door opened and I hit it, but it was the passenger door, it was not the driver door. I say that because I can tell a parked car versus a, a, a moving car. This was a moving vehicle. And so they found me 70 feet from where the car was. So I identified with doing my best. I identified with being in alignment with like, oh, I'm gonna do service and I'm gonna go to medical school. Like I always thought this was something greater. And here I am now unable to function like, Having, having had a head trauma, I like cracked my helmet in half. Um, couldn't remember. I went to, went to college after two weeks, because they didn't know what they were doing with um, you know, head traumas 20 years ago. And I went back to school and I'm like totally understanding everything that the teacher's saying. And then five minutes later, we're taking a quiz and I'm bombing the quiz. So identifying as a student, didn't work for me anymore because I was failing as a student. So if I'm failing as a student and I think I'm a good student, what does that say about my limiting belief? Now I suck. Now I'm just like, uh, I'm, I'm stupid. That's what I thought, I thought I was stupid. And then I really identified with an athlete. Like maybe I wasn't the best athlete, but I was, I was the best version of myself and my physical being. And I couldn't function, I was in pain. I didn't know if I would get out of pain. So it was, it was really hard. And there was a, I was, I was at my parents' house and um, I wasn't sleeping. And I, you're in, sometimes, you know, you're in your body so much you don't really understand like what's, what's normal. You know, that's normal and not sleeping. So my dad, it's three in the morning and he goes into my room and he's like, what are you doing? Like, you need to seek help. So I did, I sought help. I sought a counselor, saw physicians, saw surgeons, saw neurosurgeons, went to the Bay Area up in San Francisco, went to Monterey, went to Santa Cruz. I went all over the place. I tried to find people to help me put my body back together and my mind. And it was so tough because I, I, I lost my identity. So man, I was full of limiting beliefs. I was just like, I cannot do this. And I dropped out of school because I couldn't go to school. I couldn't, I couldn't read the board, you know? And no one said that like, it takes like a, the brain is a muscle too, you know, even though it's made out of fatty tissue, it's like a muscle, you know, you need to rest it if it's been through something traumatic. They didn't, that wasn't the science then. And so I didn't rest it. And I then eventually was, you know, forced to rest because I had to stop and drop out of school. 
So I had to get help and I did. I became resourceful. And when I was little, I learned how can I? And now as an adult, 18, I'm like, I don't know if it's possible, but I didn't take no for an answer. So that's the theme here is not taking no for an answer and how can I? So I sought help and I asked for help when I couldn't do it myself. A lot of times we have such a hard time asking for help because we think of it as a weakness. You know, I'm going to the counselor and I'm like, I'm stupid. And he's like, no, you have PTSD. You are not dumb. And so I'm like, cool. Now I'm stigmatized with like this four letter thing. But really when I say that to somebody, like they don't, they don't care. They're like, they see me as, as me, as Jane. Like it's okay to be Charlotte. You know, it's okay to be Clara and Ronnie. Like just being who you are. Like, that's okay, and that, that is enough, right? It's not the actions that happen that define you. It's your spirit and your drive and your love for you and life and others that defines you, right? That's a big one. That was a hard one. And I think that we go through cycles and we, we learn it, and then we have to relearn it. So I created this business because I had to pull in all these people. I don't have all the answers. I am not the answer queen, but what I do have is I have an incredible drive and passion. And with that incredible drive and passion, I bring people on my bus. I bring people on my bus, I bring people on my team, and I create a resource for myself. And what's interesting is the, the path that my life has gone is every single struggle I've had has created something beautiful. So I couldn't function, I wasn't in school. I ended up going back to school and graduating. My head got, got, got put on straight again, and I took notes. I learned, I learned a tool. I write everything down, and if I don't write any, everything down, if I'm having a conversation, that person's going to be writing everything down. I ask. I'm like, who's going to be writing it down? So I've developed skills to be able to offset maybe some of the things that were my struggles. And with my business, I created, I have a massage therapist, I have a physician now, I have great corrective exercise therapist, I have people, you know, the physician does stem cell treatment, I have acupuncture, nutritionist, because it takes a village, it takes a team to put a body back together, not just me, right? We all think that, or at least I've been, you know, stuck in this that, oh, I have to do it all myself, right? So I created this team in 2009 and I took a risk because if you all remember 2008 and 2009, what was happening? It was a huge economic crash, right? Huge. People were like, are you kidding? What are you doing? Are you nuts? And I was like, well, I went to the worst case scenario. What was the worst case scenario that could happen? I file bankruptcy. I go back moving with my parents and I'm living with them until my credit gets better. Then I get a job. And it ended up not happening. My business grew in the face of adversity. Because it wasn't, no, it was how can I? I'm like, well, if they believe in me enough to give me a loan, then hey, I must have something going. So we started the business and we had all these different people and it got to a team of about 40 people. And again, I said I had never gone to business school. I didn't really know how to manage people. I did my best because that's what I'm good at, is doing my best. But sometimes your best isn't good enough. So I had to, again, get help. Within the first five years, I had over 10, probably five to 10 business coaches. And with those five to 10 business coaches, they each had something else that they could offer. Whether it was interpersonal relationships or how to look at your key performance indicators or create a better business plan or take the business to the next level. I was able to get something from each person and when the relationship wasn't, you know, I, I was learning enough, then I, I moved on to the next one because I'm always striving, wanting to be the best version of myself and when I do that, I meet all these amazing people along the way and I create this community around myself that supports my vision. And what's so cool is that when I'm in alignment with my heart space, it inspires others and they want to work with me. So what I found in business was that sometimes they get removed. So at year five, and I'll explain that in a minute. So at year five, I had my hand in everything because I really wanted to connect with people and I really wanted to make sure that they understood my reason why I was doing this and they understood my story because that was kind of like the impetus behind the whole movement and the whole business. And if they understood me and if they knew me, they would understand the passion behind it and they would really get on board. 
then I got in another accident. So I, I, bl I blew it. I kind of blew it. This was a bike accident. This was me asking for help. I like, I'm so in, in the slides here. This is what happened. This was me. I literally fell and I couldn't get up. Some of you have heard this story. But I, I was not present. I was climbing through a bathroom window and in my house because I got locked out. And of course I was angry at Bo because he locked the door. Heaven forbid he would lock the door in a place that wasn't safe. And I was like, I don't have a key. I couldn't find a key. So, I mean, I could have had my meeting with, you know, my sister outside, but now I had to get in my house. I like got really small. I overreached and I was fine, but something was a little bit tweaked in my back. And then I got a chiropractic adjustment without proper analysis because of course, like I knew better. I wasn't the chiropractor, but I was like, Hey, you know me, let's just do the side lying adjustment. And then the next day I couldn't move. I literally fell on the floor getting out of bed or coming back from the restroom and I, I couldn't get up. And I was laying there until Bo found me. And I, you know, just told you that I'm really great at asking for help until I think I know everything and then I don't ask for help. And here I am, not able to do anything, thinking my business is gonna fail and I can't ask for help because I, I don't know how. I don't know how to ask for help in this situation. So I really had like a mindset that just wasn't, that was like constricted. My whole life, I just told you, like, I'm like resourceful and I can do all this stuff. And then I'm like, ooh, my world got really small. I wouldn't eat all day because I didn't want to go to the bathroom because I didn't want to move off the couch because I couldn't. And that lasted a, a good solid month <laughs> before I like started to, to get out of my shell. And so I thought, like I said, that my business was going to fail, that because my hands were in every piece of the pie at work, that there's no way it would be successful. But you know what it did? It forced me to know that I had my systems in place and it forced me to take a step back and actually people understood the mission of the business and they were able to shine their light and the business actually doubled. So I was totally wrong. I had this limiting belief and you know what? It just, I, it, the universe blew it out of the water. It really, really um, blew my mind. The care, the love, the support that this team had for me and for the business. They really, it was, it was their business too. Right? So why did I have this fixed mindset? That was a challenge for me. Like I, I didn't think that I had this, this problem <laughs> until I'm like laid up and then I'm realizing, oh my God, I, I really, I'm, I've got this limiting belief. I started to get help. I used my whole team and it wasn't quite good enough. I needed more. So I went to a neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon's like, well, we could do a disc replacement, but you know, disc replacement, the insurance probably won't cover it. So just try and get out of the pain cycle, you know, like put your back like this. So if my low back's like this, then my upper back's gonna be like this, and I'm walking around like him, a spine surgeon with the biggest hunchback I ever saw. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, Caitlin. It's ironic, right? It's so funny. And, I, and my, my dad's with me, he's like, oh yeah, you should just do that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That is not the example I want to be. Like I do PT, you know? Um, so, so I said no. And I said, you're telling me no. So I'm going to say, how can I? And then what did I do? I found, I found physicians. I'm looking at Sam cause her spouse works with us and he's a physician and he does stem cell therapy, which freaking changed my life. I have loose ligaments turns out and yeah, the disc was torn, but my ligaments look like Swiss cheese. So if I can, you know, regenerate the tissue, which believe it or not, you can regenerate your tissue. Yes, it does exist. It's amazing. Insurance will not cover it, but it's incredible. And I'm a freaking like raving fan because I'm here without pain in my legs. So I found a solution, but why wasn't I able to trust my team? I wasn't able to trust my team because I wasn't able to trust myself. So why wasn't I able to trust myself? So I did the stem cell. It gave me amazing pain relief. After a year though, I was like, okay, I've got pain relief, but not a hundred percent. Like I'm better, but I was, you know, 33 at the time and I didn't have kids. I still don't. And I wanted to have kids and I wanted to be able to mountain bike and surf and snowboard and do all these things that I've done before. Cause I identified still as an athlete. I couldn't do it. 
And I hated that feeling. I'm 33, I'm like in tears with the doctor, like, save me, help me. And you know what? The body's precious and it tells a story. It's a physical representation of the mental, emotional, past and present experiences. I say mental, emotional, and spiritual, and physical, and the body tells a story. So I see people, and I'll do consults. I don't, I, I don't usually, um, on occasion, I'll work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I do assessments. And I see people, and I see their body. But one of the things I do is I listen with an open heart. Because a lot of times, like myself, people come in, and they're like, they've been all over the place. And they, they're not listened to. They're a body. They're not a human, you know, in like... There's a lot of politics around why that may be. But I take a step back and I'm like, okay, I'm going to treat everybody as the individual gift that they are and I'm going to love them and I'm going to pour my love energy. I'm not telling them I love them, but I'm just opening up my heart. Like I'm opening up my heart today. And I just exude that and I listen with an open heart. And when you listen with an open heart, it's amazing what people will tell you. You know? Because the body tells a story and this part of my back was where I had pain. And if you think about the Eastern philosophies, and Bo's, you can tell there's a huge influence in my life with that. And so that's the fear meridian. The kidney meridian is the fear meridian. So what was I afraid of? Well, I couldn't, I, you know, I had this feeling that I couldn't trust my team, even though they've proved to me that they can clearly run the business better than myself. So what was I afraid of? Well, I couldn't trust myself. So why couldn't I trust myself? Well, when things happen and you believe that you're a bad person, because that's what I believe, that was my limiting belief. It's still like how you were saying, Charlotte, that like, you, you know, maybe you don't feel like you're worthy or good enough. Mine was, I'm a bad person. So when trauma happens at a small age, just like those, just like when I was five and I got to see um, Jesse Jackson and see Nelson Mandela, other, other things have, impression, have impressions on us as well. So this is, brings me to my third pivot in my life. I'm sure there's many. Every option, is, every day there's a pivot, right? It's how we, how we use it. So I had to get to the root. I had fixed my physical well-being. I got an MRI and the MRI is like, your ligaments are looking good, but I still have pain. One of the reasons, and I of course have to justify it, I'm a scientist, so I'm like, okay, I have to justify the physical reason why I have pain. Oh, when I stress out, my diaphragm contracts, it hurts my low back, I've got pain down my legs. And you know, you can't really fix a disc, but it didn't matter. But it was more than that. So I'm laying on the acupuncture table, so I really do my best to use our services because I wanna, you know, walk my talk, and it's hard, especially when it's work, and I'm like on the acupuncture table with my cell phone sometimes. Um, but this time I wasn't, and I'm really trying to figure out what's going on with my body. And I just started to cry, you know, kind of like how some of you guys did today. I just started to cry and I didn't understand why. And I was like, wow, I'm in a lot of pain. And it wasn't really physical pain, it was emotional pain. How Bo was talking about that beach ball and, you know, we're pushing the energy down. If you push it down, if it's, if it's bad energy and you're pushing it down and you're pushing it down, it's like being in a, being a, you know, you're pushing a beach ball down in water. What happens? It like comes out. Right? So this beach ball of energy is coming out in other ways, right? And my control of my team and my lack of trust in my team and my abrasive way that I'm talking to them because I'm not trusting myself, right? And I'm still able to run a pretty successful business having this crap in my life, right? So what was it? So I was, you know, I was abused as a kid. And I didn't realize that like that was such a huge, had, had such a huge impact in my life. I thought, oh, well, that was, if bad things happen to bad people. That's what I thought. I'm 36, and that was me at like 10, and like, bad things happen to bad people. I didn't tell anyone for 30 years, or 20 years, I guess. And then the telling was the scary part. It wasn't just telling the person who did it. That, I didn't think I'd survive that but it was telling the people around me, my family, and, and how they would not love me, or my friends that would look at me a certain way, or the people around me that would like, mm. 
But what happens? What happened when I did that? My limiting belief was such crap. Because what happened was people loved me that much more. Can you believe it? I, I was shocked. So I found my voice. I found my voice and I realized I couldn't be quiet. Because how was that serving me? It wasn't. It wasn't serving me. It wasn't serving my team. And I didn't really have a choice. The thing is, is like once you hit that awareness opportunity and you realize that there's something that you should do, but you don't want to do, that's when it becomes like, oh God, now I have to do it. Because otherwise I'm out of integrity with myself. And like, who wants to live like that? It doesn't feel good. But a lot of times we don't, we can't get there. We don't know how to get there until we get still. There's this book, if you ever want to make a transformation, there's this book, it's called The Presence Process by Michael Brown. It's the revised edition. The only way out is through. I keep telling myself that because when you're in, when, when you have challenging times in your life, we gotta go back to what, what's our mission, what's our purpose, what's our passion, and what's standing in the way of that passion. Well, I could go around this thing and not say anything, but then it's still there and it has so much power. So if I hit it head on and I have my support team, because I didn't do it alone, I had a counselor, I had my parents, one parent, I had you know my spouse, I had my staff. I was like holding this secret from everybody and I didn't want to share it and then I realized, God, I have to share because if I don't share, then they're not, they don't, they have no perspective. They have no perspective on the reason why I do what I do or the reason why I behave how I behave. It doesn't necessarily justify all my actions, but it gives people an understanding. And when they have an understanding, they have more compassion and empathy. And when they have more compassion and empathy, we can connect. And when we can connect, we can make change. So I found my voice and it was scary. And the only way out is through. So I went through. And then everyone's like, oh, don't you feel better? No. I did not. But this is so on it. To thine own self be true. We got to be true to ourself. And when, so Nelson Mandela, um, his inaugural address about doing, um, you know, letting your light shine. It's actually a Marianne Williamson quote. And it's, I'm not, I'm not going to say the whole thing because I don't remember it off exactly, but it's, you know, like, if we don't allow our light to shine, you actually are doing a disservice to others. So by you not speaking out and you, and you not telling your truth, you're actually hurting everybody around you because you're not giving them permission to shine. When you speak your truth and you get clear on what that is, you actually allow other people to do the same. And it increases the whole collective energy and it improves the community. And then we get the world that we want, not the world that we have, right? So you gotta be careful with this because we're in a vulnerable space here and everyone's super stoked on each other and we're like in this inclusive energy and environment. And we're gonna go outside of here and you're gonna talk to your spouse or your friend and they didn't show up today. And so they may not be able to resonate at that same frequency that you're at. And then you might be judging or they might be judging you like, oh, you just don't get it. You weren't there. It was awesome and you, you missed out. Or they might be like, wow, this person's like high as a kite, what's going on? But we have to remember to stay true to what we believe in and to our heart and also have a good gate up. So think about it for a second. The exercise is go ahead and close your eyes. And you're going to think about that drawbridge or that gate in front of you. You're the castle. You're this amazing castle. And that castle is your heart. And when you let the drawbridge down and let the gates open, you've got this feeling of elation and love and wholeheartedness and freedom and spirituality and encouragement and openness. And that's what it feels like to have an open heart. And it feels amazing and it's awesome. 
But you know what? Not everyone can receive your greatness all the time. And bad energy can come your way. So mentally imagine lifting the drawbridge, shutting the gates. Shut the gates. You are in control. You can open the gates and let the light shine and you can shut the gates. And you can say, no, take a, take a ticket, go to the back of the line, like Yvonne said. So go ahead and open your eyes. But having that mental picture is going to help you in your daily life when you are having that talk with someone who doesn't necessarily believe the same way you do. That's okay. You, you're not being inauthentic to show not all of yourself to everyone. You know, I'm being vulnerable. I'm sharing a lot of my story with you today. Doesn't mean I'm going to run down the street and parade that, uh, hey, I was abused, right? It's not, it's not appropriate. And it may not be well received. So I got my gate up. And sometimes I might open the door and see, and then maybe, maybe I'm going to let the drawbridge down. But it's precious. That, that space is special, right? That is your light. That's your fire. And we want everyone to be able to see it, but sometimes they're not ready. And that's okay. So just be... Having that mental energy and that mental image is going to really help you to be able to discern and have that healthy boundary. And that's, that's a challenge. That is a constant challenge and sometimes you might overshare and sometimes your feelings might get hurt. And then you learn, right? So that's weeding and watering. That's like the summer. We've got this passion and this heart and we want to go in the direction of ease in a way. And how do we do that? Well, we got to weed what isn't working. So what's not working? What are you, what are you wasting your time on? What are those unhealthy relationships that you, you have? Remember, once you have awareness, shame on you once you don't do anything about it, right? I mean, what I realized in this whole process of self-discovery was um, I'm not great at a lot of things. So what I do is I surround myself with great people like yourself. And that's how I become great. Because when, I'm, when I think I suck at something, I go for it. I go, yeah, let's go. And I jump right in. Because then I be can become an expert. So like this personal self-work, I mean, I have done a lot of it in my whole life. Um, but I would nef definitely not say I was an expert. But then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn firsthand what this is all about. And... And so here I am. So I found that I was super, super sensitive. And I had an experience with some psychedelics. I, I'm like, don't ever do drugs. Never. I don't, <laughs> I don't smoke. I've never, I've smoked pot like once in my life. I don't drink alcohol. I was on um, so many medications that I realized like, wow, if I don't have to put something negative in my body, I don't want to. It's not very high energy. Well, I thought, okay, I have a lot of baggage. And I really wanted to fast forward my baggage D deposit, right? I wanted to like dump it off and I knew that if I didn't do something it was going to take me years and I was like, I want to go fast. So I decided to try psychedelic or psychotropic and um, it was scary. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. It's like super hard on your liver and with anything like that it takes a toll. It takes a toll on your psyche because it's not super high vibration and, um, and so there's a repercussion. There always is. Um, but anyway, in that whole experience, I realized that I can't, like TV, man, I can't, watch, I, can't watch, I can't watch bad things on TV because I internalize it. I cannot watch violent movies. Like there's enough violence in the world I just can't deal. I don't, want, I don't listen to the news, right? So there's certain things I realized, like I don't listen to the news. I listen to some stuff, but I don't listen to pop TV news. I can't because it's just it's so, it's such jargon and it's just, it doesn't work for me. It might work for you, it doesn't work for me. I found that out. So I'm weeding what isn't working and then I'm setting boundaries around it. And then I know that if I go and do that because maybe that's what my friends are doing or that's what like, that's the cool thing tonight. Like I'm taking responsibility for my, for me doing that. Like I want to watch a movie because my whole family is and it might be violent and, and I just know that like that's going to take a toll on me. But when we're really present, we get to understand and discover these things about ourselves that we maybe we didn't know before. And that's super exciting because it makes you unique. And obviously negative self-talk is never good. You might, you know, some people say like, oh, well, I'm being real with myself. That's what I would say. Like, I'm being real with myself. It's like, no, you're being mean. And what do we do with mean girls? We go, no, 
No. I went to this, um, Monica had the, what was it called again, the thing that we just did? The give back bash? Yeah, the give back bash. It was awesome. There's a bunch of women I didn't know. I didn't even know that she did this. And I was like, well, I want to be a part of it. And I went. And one of the things they did was they did affirmation tables. And my affirmation was like, my life is unfolding to its highest good. And like, you know, I trust the universe. And with God, all things are possible. And it's right there where I brush my teeth every day. I read it. So there's enough negativity, we gotta like surround ourselves with the positivity and man, you, wherever you can find it, freaking bring it in. There's over 4,000 4, impressions that we get a day in advertising. Over 4,000. One day. So you think, well, gosh, I'm not a positive person or man, this is a lot of work. Yeah, it is a lot of work because you have 4,000 times you're being impressed upon advertising things that makes you want to go buy something and you don't have one positive affirmation. So you're probably not going to remember that you're great because you're not advertising to yourself, right? So you got to advertise to yourself. <laughs> I'm not, no joke, man. Like post-its all around my house. And then you got to water what's working. Things that help you focus. I listen to books on tape, man. I feel like I'm getting a PhD. Audible's great. Um, healthy relationships. And sometimes relationships are healthy and sometimes they were healthy and right now they're not healthy and then they're going to be healthy again. And that's okay. It just depends on where you're at in your life. And then approaches that bring you success. So collaboration is a, is an approach that brings me success and the belief that I can trust my team brings me success and the belief that I'd rather have a small piece of a bigger pie and I'd much rather work with other people. I used to think I had to do it all myself and I just, as soon as I let that thought go, man, my life just, I, I feel like I got so much more successful. And then positive media, things like this, right? Things in the community, you know, someone's opening up, having a grand opening on Wednesday, you should all go, um, store downtown on Pacific between Zocalis and Fiber. Fiber. Fiber, that's, yeah. So it's Wednesday. But building community, those are all positive things. And then remember, don't, don't water your weeds and focus on what's working, not what's not. One of the things, so I grew up in this um, non-denominational church and there is based on five principles and one was that God was everywhere. So I think the universe has my back sometimes, but I try to always think that. Sometimes I don't think that, but it still does. And because like all these pivotal moments, like I was thinking I'm a bad person and like God hates me, right? But really they're pivotal moments and they're opportunities for growth and they're things that I didn't even realize were my lemonade. It was my lemonade. I mean, I wouldn't be here, right? Like I have a multi-million dollar business and I wouldn't been able to say that if I didn't get hit by a car, right? So you really want to focus on what's working. That's a, that's a really big one. And you want to be gentle with yourself. That's also watering, right? Be gentle with yourself and surround yourself with good people. That's a cool photo, huh? So I've got this passion. We've all got this passion. And you got to be careful because the adrenals are a real thing. <laughs> and we want to make sure that we don't burn out. So I would never say that I'm an extrovert. I get energy from being quiet, but I love also being with people. So I have to have balance between being with people and being on my own and, and being reflective. So understanding yourself is gonna really help you to keep that fire going and not, and not burn out. And when you can't look at yourself in the mirror because you're, that your mirror in front of you is foggy and you don't see the greatness that you are, you find it, you fake it till you make it. The other principle that I learned when I was younger in this church that we went to was thoughts in mind produce after their kind. So I, I mean, I took it literally when I was little, I was like, oh my God, I'm thinking bad thoughts. So every time I got in trouble, I was like, that was because of a bad thought that I created, right? Even if it was my brother doing something, I was like, oh no, I did that. Um, so whether that's true or not, I know that overall in my life, thoughts in mind do produce after their kind. So that's why it's so important to put positive affirmations up and have positive belief systems about yourself and others because when we surround ourselves with the cup being half full, the cup is going to be half full. And when we surround ourselves with the cup being half empty, the cup is going to be half empty. Right? So it's super important to remind yourself that with, with every situation, 
there is a possibility. It's not that I couldn't walk, it's how can I walk? I found a way. It's not that I have to have surgery, it's how can I avoid surgery? I found a way, right? Thank you.